Welcome to the second part of the lecture of the recognized project on defensibility in law, a very brief introduction to its challenges. As I mentioned before, my name is Lucas Miseri, and I work as an assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy of Law at Alicante University of Spain. In the previous part of this lecture, we dealt with some definitions and historical background of the concept of defensibility some standpoints that consider the feasibility an essential feature of law, those that reject that claim, and those that nuance it by claiming the feasibility is more an attitude about how to treat rules. At the end of the first part, some aspects of the debate about the feasibility rules and principles were mentioned but not developed. In this part, I'm going to elaborate on that relationship using as a source Manuel Atienza and Juan, uh, Juan Ruiz Manero's chapter, Rules, Principles, and the Feasibility, as appeared in the volume edited by Ferrer and Ratti, I mentioned in the part one. <clears throat> in some way, uh, the chapter summarizes the key aspect of Atienza and Ruiz Manero's positivist theory of law as appearing previously in Spanish in their books, uh, Las Piezas del Derecho and Ilicitos Atípicos. Las Piezas del Derecho appeared in 1996 and it was translated into English in 1998 as a theory of legal sentences in Springer. All, uh, but I think Ilicitos Atípicos is not translated it could be something like a typical illicit or unlawful acts theory. Um, okay, let's address this post-positivistic view on the feasibility. Uh, one of the first authors in using the term legal post-positivism was Neil McCormick. Among the many legal scholars that are usually associated with this term are also this Scottish author, but the famous American legal philosopher Ronald Dworkin, the Argentine Carlos uh, Nino, the German legal philosopher Robert Alexi, and of course in Spain, the authors that we will discuss in a minute, Manuel Atienza and Juan Ruiz Manero. Um, the Spanish scholars consider post-positivism a theoretical need, although they accept the thesis of the social sources of law as the positivist legal scholars. That justified the part of the term that is positivistic. And the post is because they question the separation thesis between moral, moral and legal realm. That is why it's not a surprise that in that chapter I'm using as a source, and many of their criticism is directly explicitly against exclusivist positivism. Atien San Ruiz Manero considered that Dworkin's criticism on positivism seminal, and how this American author raised awareness of the fact that rules have an underlying justification, and in his regard, purposes and values intended to be served by those rules are themselves part of the law. <clears throat> Furthermore, they have a certain priority over the rules, which are merely means to implement them. To claim their priority implies that the meaning and scope of the rules ought to be interpreted essentially under the light of those values and purposes. That is, the demands derived thereof might justify introducing certain exceptions which are not contemplated in pre-existing rules. That's our topic, the feasibility. Those rules will then be defeated, or whenever rules are silent or generate incompatible duties, those values and purposes make it possible to determine the content of pre-existing legal duty. For Atien San Ruiz Manero, law appears well of all as a mechanism where practical disputes and controversies are decided within a limited time period by means of authoritative decisions that involve, of course, rules. By being so issued, they provide us, at least initially, with pre-existing solutions for an unlimited number of individual cases. However, another factor 
to take into account is the reduction of complexity. That is, uh, could be considered the last element to complete the set of definitional properties of law or legal system. Our Spanish authors have filmed that there, there cannot be law if there are no rules. Such a system, very much like the one imagined by Plato in his Republic um, in the ancient time, uh, a system conferring absolute discretion to dispute resolution orients, would not meet the demands generally associated with the terms law or legal system. Notice that they, they do not uh, derive a special essence of the word or the concept to try to reconstruct how it's considered uh, as law. <clears throat> Nevertheless, there are reasons to regard law not merely as a matter of rules, but also as a matter of explicit and implicit values and purposes. One of the main reasons is to avoid serious value flaws. For an exclusive positivist, um, I think there is a manner to say that law is regarded exclusively as a set of indivisible rules. They use Regan's terminology <clears throat> where uh, an exclusive positivist would consider law as compounded by indivisible rules. Those rules are opaque to principles. On, on to the principles that justify them that um, in some way are their grounding. On the extreme pole, <clears throat> the non-positivist would consider all rules defensible and rules would be transparent to principles. <clears throat> in, in some way, um, I think the Ruiz Manero is trying to consider that uh, not the, the rules are not strictly all uh, immediately defeasible. <clears throat> uh, there, there are institutional reasons to respect them. <clears throat> but um, there, there is a need of balance between uh, the pole of rules associated with the idea of predictability, of uh, reduction of complexity, and uh, the, the pole of principles uh, of, of the idea of coherence with the inherent values. Uh, I noticed that on the slide there's a typo, there's a mistake. Uh, the principle should be on one of the, uh, on the right arrow. Okay. Uh, this is a reminder of how that one of the fundamental criteria to evaluate a theory of law is to test its ability to give account of how and at what point allowing that spectrum the tension between what can be called the pole of rules and the pole of principles. And that should be articulated and solved. And that's what, what they try to do in their theory. They consider that law is a practice guided by purposes and values, and it has two levels, the levels of the rules and the levels of the principles. Let's see how those levels interact and how Atienz and Ruiz Manero try to save the criticism of the defensibility of the whole legal system and the one of the relevance of one of those levels. One example this is, uh, could be describing how they address that relationship in the theory of the atypical acts, both unlawful and lawful. <clears throat> they focus on the idea of analogy, as it's important to understand how they deal with the atypical acts. They both agree that they can start from this classical distinction between analogia iuris and analogia legis. Both involve a weak permission of uh, the level of rules. This means that the particular actions prima facie permitted since it cannot be subsumed with any prohibitory rule. The operation of a deontic status conversion, however, differs from one case to another. In the case of analogia legis, the reason for the eventual prohibition, all things considered, rests on the resemblance between the unregulated case and another case or several other cases in which a certain private rule is involved. A justification for this is that the reasons, the balance of principles justifying the provision in these latter cases also apply in the case that appear as not regulated. In other words, put it simple, that balance been between principles claim to generate a new prohibitory rule within which the particular act is to be subsumed. In the case of analogia iuris, the generation of a new prohibitory rule is directly claimed by the balance among the relevant principles that apply in the case. 
although no pre-existing prohibitory rule under which other similar cases are to be subsumed is provided by the system. A second mechanism, which applies in the case of uh, abuse of right, fraud on the law, and misuse of power, is of particular concern for Athens and Ruiz Manero, and it works as follows. The starting point is the previous existence of an explicit permission. Consequently, the action is prima facie permitted by a regulatory rule the strong provision. <clears throat> the modification of the deontic status of that particular action occurs as a consequence of the incoherence, do you remember the fold of principles uh, linked to coherence, the incoherence subsequently manifested between the case of Zoom within the rule mentioned and the principle of the system. Hence, the case constitutes what they call an axiological gap, a body gap in the system of rules. Here, the balance among principles argues for the generation of a new prohibitory rule within which the case is to be subsumed. The definition of an axiological gap is inspired in Acheron's and Bolivian's celebrated book, Normative Systems. Despite their different approaches, they held and it is adapted to the idea of principles of being part of law and not something external to it, ideological or political. <clears throat> Athens and Ruiz Manero's definition of an axiological gap is like this. A case constitutes an axiological gap in a particular legal system if and only if first. In the system, there is a rule that establishes a solution for the case. And still, second, that rule does not consider as relevant a given property which, according to the demands entailed by the balance of the applicable principles in the particular legal system, should be considered. The existence of, of this atypical unlawful acts responds to a demand for coherence claimed by any legal system. What is at the stake is a demand for a proper fit between the directed dimension of the law and its justificatory dimension, that is, the request for integrity of rules and principles. Some system, uh, system claim at the end of Manero Clearly, civil law system achieved this goal by way of implementing the above mentioned mechanism. Analogy on the one hand, an abuse of rights, fraud of the law, and misuse of power on the other. Analogy plays an important role in other systems, common law systems too, but their function equivalent to those other civil law concepts according to Matthias and Ruiz Manero can pro probably be found in the technique of distinguishing or in plain resort to principles. In this sense, it may be advanced that the category of atypical and lawful acts is general to all developed legal systems due to its significance as a necessary means for experience from extreme formalism in the application of the law. For extreme formalism would entail nothing but a sort of value and coherence of legal decisions. <clears throat> Therefore, the three concepts comprising the general category of atypical illicit acts, this is abuse of right, fraud on the law, and misuse of power, share the following features. A. There is an action which is prima facie permitted by rule. B. Either intentionally or not, an injury or damage is caused by that action. C the unlawful character of that damage is show up in the light of the balance of the relevant principles of the legal system and the, the creation as a result of that balancing of a new rule limiting the scope of the former rule since the new rule considers as forbidden certain actions that were permitted under the former. <clears throat> but if there are a typical unlawful acts, at the end, Richman also acknowledged the existence of atypical lawful acts. <clears throat> In this case um, of atypical illicit acts, um, in the case of atypical illicit acts, either a weak permission when a rule is provided in case of analogy or a strong permission when there is a pre-existing permissive rule in case of abuse of rights, fraud on law or deviation of power is defeated and it's thrown in the case of atypical illicit or lawful acts a prohibitory rule is defeated because uh, the damage the prohibitory rule is trying to avoid either is not produced 
Uh, for instance, let's imagine uh, the example provided by Antonio Ruiz Manero is a park where it's prohibited uh, to drive vehicles, but after closing times, uh, there is no point on, uh, on that prohibition. Or they said it's compensated by a superior good. For instance, imagine that that very park uh, during open open time, uh, an ambulance needs to go through. So that's a justified exception. Or C is in, um, insignificant. And here the example provided is that drug dealing cases when the substance in question is dramatically neutralized or it's a, it's a very low amount. <clears throat> uh, so this is, broadly speaking, the theory of atypical acts by uh, Atienz and Ruiz Manero's post-positivistic theory. There is an objection uh, raised by Italian legal scholar Bruno Celano, uh, who says that the approach implies an overvaluation of principles and an undervaluation of rules to the point that those rules uh, seem irrelevant. He says, at, I quote, I quote, uh, what depends on rules is just the possibility of ascribing lawful or unlawful behaviors depending on their conformity or not to the relevant principles, the inconsequential label of typical or atypical, end of quote. The purpose of Atienza and Rizmanero category of atypical, unlawful, or lawful acts is to give adequate account of the divisibility of the pre-existing permissive or prohibitory rule when the solution to a case it generates turns out to be axiologically anomalous to an intolerable extent. As explained above, it is a type of reasoning that leads us from the pre-existing rule to a new rule because one of the primary roles of principle, it must be remarked, is to generate new rules. The whole purpose of Atienza and Ruiz Manero with their theory of a typical act is the institutionalization of the feasibility in the law. But one could ask how legal operators and legal scholars know that an outcome is axiologically anomalous. And that would involve discussing some of the meta-ethical background of Atienza and Ruth Manero theory. For instance, Manuel Atienza's minimal objectivism, minimal moral objectivism. But that is a topic for another lecture. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have learned something for, from this lecture. Otherwise, I would feel terribly defeated. Thank you very much.